From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Well, today we're going to just visit, talk a little bit, and we're going to talk about some of the subjects that end time events, what's going to happen. And, you know, it's a strange thing. I kind of, I had a little moment this past weekend, and I listened to television a little bit, uh, even tuned into one program where they had three doctors. And it was so ridiculous. The things they were teaching, blind leading the blind. Let me tell you something, just because some character writes a book doth a Bible scholar not make, all right? There's only one way you can be a student of God's Word, and that's to know how to study His Word. So I just felt that first opportunity I had, we were going to talk about two of the main deceptions of the end times. And we have a lot of new people that join us all the time, so I just want to talk a little bit first about the so-called rapture theory. Why? It's taught that in the end times, rather than having the gospel armor on in place to do battle against Satan and his children, you're going to fly away, run like a scared chicken. I know that probably offends some, be that as it may. We want to discuss this. It isn't important what I say about it or what you say about it or what anyone else says about it. What's important is what does the Word of God say about it, all right? Don't, don't ever forget that. Most students or teachers or doctors of God's Word in seminaries are taught how to utilize certain commentaries. Now, and that's about as far as they go use this good commentary or that good commentary. And all a commentary, commentary is, is usually some man's work a generation or two or three before your time based on the events that were happening at that time. So it's outdated and it's a, it's a man's opinion which throws it into the category of traditions of men. So beware of commentary teachers. You know, just because you can read a book or, um, or quote some man's commentary doesn't make you a Bible student, all right? <clears throat> Again, a Bible student is one that studies the Word of God and is a student of that book, that Word. And basically, I like to call it the manuscripts, all right? Now, <clears throat> a teacher, a true teacher, I'm just going to give you some little clues as to how you can tell whether you're studying under a true teacher with a gift from God or someone else. A true teacher will teach you how to think and study for yourself. A true teacher will recommend to you the tools that you will need. Let's say that if you're only an English speaking person that will have the ability to break, say the King James, back to the original languages, that's to say Hebrew or Greek. because. It doesn't do any good necessarily. It might help in certain cases. But if you're really studying God's Word, a Webster's Dictionary is not going to help you that much. Because the, Eng the English is translated by men. It is for this reason that we keep uh, copies of the original King James 1611 because it has within it, even before you get to the scriptures, a letter to you, the reader, by the translators. They, they have a message there. In other words, the translators that translated the good old King James from the Greek, the 
Hebrew and the Chaldee, wrote you a letter that they felt was very important. It's quite a lengthy letter to warn you of the very same things I'm warning you of now, to helping you to think. Just stop and think a moment. God's Word was given in those languages. And you have to basically go to those languages, especially in the critical points, before you're going to understand. Now, second, the things they were teaching, blind leading the blind, let me tell you something. Just because some character writes a book doth a Bible scholar not make, all right? There's only one way you can be a student of God's Word, and that's to know how to study His Word. So I just felt that first opportunity I had, we were going to talk about two of the main deceptions of the end times. And we have a lot of new people that join us all the time. So I just want to talk a little bit first about the so-called rapture theory. Why? It's taught that in the end times, rather than having the gospel armor on in place to do battle against Satan and his children, you're going to fly away. Run like a scared chicken. I know that probably offends some, be that as it may. We want to discuss this. It isn't important what I say about it or what you say about it or what anyone else says about it. What's important is what does the Word of God say about it, all right? Don't, don't ever forget that. Most students or teachers or doctors of God's Word in seminaries are taught how to utilize certain commentaries. Now, and that's about as far as they go. Use this good commentary or that good commentary. And all a commentary, commentary is, is usually some man's work a generation or two or three before your time based on the events that were happening at that time. So it's outdated, and it's a, it's a man's opinion, which throws it into the category of traditions of men. So beware of commentary teachers. You know, just because you can read a book or, um, or quote some man's commentary doesn't make you a Bible student, all right? <clears throat> Again, a Bible student is one that studies the Word of God and is a student of that book, that Word. And basically, I like to call it the manuscripts, all right? Now, <clears throat> a teacher, a true teacher, I'm just going to give you some little clues as to how you can tell whether you're studying under a true teacher with a gift from God or someone else. A true teacher will teach you how to think and study for yourself. A true teacher will recommend to you the tools that you will need. Let's say that if you're only an English speaking person, that will have the ability to break, say, the King James back to the original languages, that's to say Hebrew or Greek. Because it doesn't do any good necessarily. It might help in certain cases. But if you're really studying God's Word, a Webster's Dictionary is not going to help you that much. Because the, Eng the English is translated by men it is for this reason that we keep uh, copies of the original King James 1611 because it has within it, even before you get to the scriptures, a letter to you, the reader, by the translators. They, they have a message there. In other words, the translators that translated the good old King James from the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Chaldee wrote you a letter that they felt was very important. It's quite a lengthy letter to warn you of the very same things I'm warning you of now, to helping you to think. Just stop and think a moment. God's Word was given in those languages. 
And you have to basically go to those languages, especially in the critical points, before you're going to understand. Now, secondly, one of the most important things to learn and to think about is to rightly divide the word. What does that mean? Always be aware of who it is written to, the particular book or chapter or verse or whatever the subject and the object, who's being discussed. What time frame was it given in? Was this a type of something that would be in the end times or is it literal? It, it does not take a great deal of time to be very efficient in growing skilled in those departments. Example, the book of James is written to the tribes scattered abroad. That's to say the tribes of Israel. James' teaching having to do with what the tribes' obligations and duties would be in the relationship with Jesus Christ. So, to be able to rightly divide the word. You know, you know one of the main reasons that I really like all my students to have the Companion Bible and yes, it, the Bible, the price of the Bible helps bring us to you on the air, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is that it teaches you how to outline the scriptures. In other words, to make an outline whereby you realize who all the they's and them's and so forth and what subjects pertain to. It, it is important if you intend to make an intelligent study of God's Word, and that's the way you're going to build your faith, is to recognize again, it doesn't come from some man, it doesn't come from some commentary. The truth comes from the Word of God, and it's what it says that is important. Now, let's talk about the so-called rapture theory, all right? And you for yourself must decide. This is not done to offend anyone, but to cause you to look for yourself. To, In other words, I suppose we're covering a very basic subject, but I want to show you how to study. Greek and Hebrew are what I call a fixed language. In other words, almost every generation English has many words that take on a total different meaning, uh, such as bebop and, and uh, rap and uh, many other things. That, and sometimes we even change not, bad to good, and good to bad. Uh, I'm saying in, in, in generation, is a um, way of expressing themselves. English is not a fixed language, but the Greek is. And as long as you, in your outline or when you're considering a set of verses, there's a subject and an object. The Greek will not change those subjects and objects on you with the exception of using types and symbolism at times, then the subject and object will be the same. What you have to understand is what does this particular thing symbolize, all right? Such as in the last verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation, it very clearly tells you these stars are angels. So when it speaks of a star, that's symbolic of an angel, all right? So, but watch closely. Now, the rapture theory is basically built upon this closing scriptures of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, where Paul is uh, teaching concerning our gathering back to Christ. Let's pick the thought up in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians in the 13th verse, and let's cover it carefully now, very carefully. The 13th verse reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means those that are dead, those that have gone on before us, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That means the heathen. I don't want you, Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant as the heathen are concerning where the dead are, those that are asleep. That, my dear friends, is the subject, all right? We're not going to change away from that subject. Greek will not afford that. All right, now let's go with verse 14. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you either believe that or you're not a Christian, if you believe that Christ died, was in the tomb, but came forth from that tomb, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, what is that saying? If you believe Christ rose, so did their spiritual bodies. God could not bring them, Christ could not bring them with him if they were not with him. All right? As it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, to be absent, well, rather, to dust to dust for the flesh body, but the spirit itself goes instantly with the soul to the Father, the spirit being the intellect of the soul. Goes instantly to the Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Now, there are some that we know from the Apocrypha and the parable taught by Christ concerning Lazarus and the rich man, and the subject still is where are the dead? Don't be ignorant. That's what Paul stated. Nothing about a rapture, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. And this is very important that you hang on to that subject. Don't, don't let man's teachings interfere with the teachings of God himself, all right? And we know from that uh, parable of Lazarus and the rich man that there was a gulf between, even in paradise, where some of these souls were in holding for judgment to hell. And I know in the parable of the, it is spoken of as he is in hell. Well, in a way, he is mentally. The lake of fire does not come into being until the last day of the millennium. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of God. Now, this is not some man's traditions. It's not some Bible commentary. It is this we say to you by the word of God that we which are alive, that's you, and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not, I repeat, shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why? Don't be ignorant about it. We cannot prevent them because they're already with him. It means we can in no wise precede them, is what the Greek says, because they're already with him. They're not going to be raised to him. They already have been. All right? So don't, don't let man deceive you. Watch the subject and watch the object in the Word of God and think for yourself. This is very important. And I will explain why in the closing um, minutes of this lecture, why it is extremely important that you understand these scriptures and be not ignorant as the heathen are as to where the dead are. They're already with him. We in no ways, it is stated in this verse, can precede them. Why? It's obvious. They're already there. If you believe Christ rose, you better believe they did too, all right? Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, that's the seventh trump, and the voice of the seventh angel mentioned in Revelation, what, about 7.14, and the dead in Christ shall rise first after a colon, all right? Simply recapping the thought, the dead will rise first, why? Because they're already there. And we which are alive, Paul covers this more in depth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 52. In an instant, at the last trump, and only at the last trump, does the change come, all right? Now listen carefully. It is important that you spend 20 bucks. What is that compared to the price of your soul? And, and or $30, whatever, and pick up a Strong's Concordance. Don't take a substitute. Don't take a Young's. Don't take some other piece of junk. Get a Strong's 
exhaustive concordance whereby you as an English speaking person can break it back to the languages whereby you can understand what these scriptures say in the Greek. Don't go get a Webster's. That will not help you in this case. What you need to know is what did the original manuscript say in the Greek or Hebrew. All right. Now, so what did he say there? At the seventh trump, at the shout of, of that uh, seventh angel, we that are alive and remain, we're going to see Christ returning to this earth and not until, all right? Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now this is where the so-called rapture doctrine comes from. This is at the seventh trump, at the last trump, we will be caught up, what? From the flesh, sinning flesh, together with them in the clouds, which simply as clouds as you, Paul spoke colloquial Greek. You might call it street Greek. To him, this meant a large group, like a covey of quail, a cloud of quail. There was a whole cloud of grasshoppers out there, all right? To meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And it is true, when the Lord returns, he's here forever. He will be on this earth forever. At the seventh trump, and the seventh trump only, don't let some joker, have you paid strict attention to the subject and the object? Paul saying, are you ignorant as to where the dead are? All he has said is, they're already with Christ. And when he returns, we're going to be changed into and meet him in the air. There's just one big problem with this word air here, and it's important that you have a strong concordance to check it out in the Greek, air. Do you know what it is? It's the breath. Your breath body, ruach in the Hebrew, or pneuma in the uh, Greek meaning your spirit body. In other words, in an instant, you're going to be changed from the flesh into a spiritual body. The breath of life that God breathed into the flesh shall be in its own breath body. That's all it means. That we will be changed exactly as it is written by this same teacher, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, 3 and 4 that instantly we're changed into that incorruptible body. He spends half of the chapter teaching that you should not be ignorant again as to the two bodies of man, the dualism, the flesh body and the spiritual body. Let's continue. Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. They should be a comfort to you. That God's elect as it is written in Mark 13, will stand against the false Messiah. Now, Paul, when he wrote this to the Thessalonians, the entire books, one and two of Thessalonians, was basically, the subject was the return of Christ. In other words, Paul is making it very clear and he doesn't want you to be ignorant as to where he is, whereby you will know where he returns from and where we will be in relationship to that. The subject is all those that are asleep, if you believe Christ rose from the dead and they're dead in him, you better believe they're with him already there. And then when he returns at the seventh trump, as it is written, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we're going to join them right here in the breath of life, the air body, spiritual body, in other words. That's all Paul has said. Now, this caused quite an uproar, and it still does to this day. But the so-called rapture doctrine did not come into being, was not taught by Paul. But it came into being in the year 1830 by a very disturbed mentally disturbed person who suffered depression and many other things. And naturally, there were two preachers standing by, and boy, they grabbed onto it. The next thing you know, you got the any moment now doctrine. But very specifically, I'm going to show you why the rapture doctrine is extremely dangerous. 
Paul knew it was dangerous, and that's why he wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians, because they misunderstood the first letter, as most do today, when they follow commentaries are the teachings of other men, the traditions of men. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I'm going to go a little more into depth than we've ever gone before in this. It is your way of teaching this also. So just relax with me and let it flow. Why is the rapture doctrine dangerous? Let's find out. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 1. Now we beseech you. Do you know what that states in the Greek? I really want to talk something over very serious with you. Brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, I want to talk to you about the return or the coming, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, as to how we are going to gather back to him, picking up this thought from 1 Thessalonians, the first letter in chapter 4 about where Christ is, when we're getting going to be back with him, when he comes, seventh trump, meet him in the air, spiritual body, in a large cloud of witnesses. All right? So he's, he's picking that thought up again. That's what the subject will be, is when this takes place, what will be happening on this earth at that time. Okay? Verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind. In other words, don't let some man or some teacher shake you up or be troubled. I don't want you worrying about it. Neither by spirit, don't let some spirit evil or otherwise tell you different, nor by word, that's to say some man's word, nor by a letter as from us, not by that first Thessalonians letter. Don't let that trouble you about our getting back together with Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Christ is at hand. In other words, I, don't, I want to make this clear because it's apparent that it upsets some of you. <laughs> Boy, does it still to this day, a very dangerous thing. Boy, does Satan take advantage of it. Why is it dangerous? Listen. In other words, make, now let's, let's get our thoughts back. Paul saying, I want to talk very serious to you about our gathering back together with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want you to let that first letter I wrote you, some spirit, some person, some word, convince you of any other thing. Verse 3, let no man deceive you. Now the deception of the end times is very critical to those that are still here. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That's to say, our gathering back in that air body with Christ, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, that, that really, it's cut and dried then. The subject then becomes the man of sin, the son of perdition. Who is who? You know, there is only one entity that Almighty God has already sentenced to perish. It does not take a Bible scholar to figure that out. You know where it is. 28th chapter of Ezekiel, it's the king of Tyre, which is to say, the, co the cherub that cover covereth, Satan. Right? The false rock, that's what Tyrus means in the Hebrew tongue, is the false rock. Or at least in that particular case it does. What has he said then? I'm going to tell you something, my friend. This is so contrary to what is commonly taught in the traditions of men that it should make you recognize the danger therein. What Paul has told you 
is I want to talk to you about our gathering back to Christ. That we're not about to meet him until after the son of perdition sets foot on this earth and there is a great falling away, which the word is apostia in the Greek, meaning the great apostasy, the great deception. Well, I still don't quite understand. Oh, think a moment. Traditions of men have taught you to be ignorant as the heathen, whereby you are expecting to fly away to the first Messiah that appears. And what Paul is telling you, that first spurious Messiah is the son of perdition. The same as Christ taught it in Mark 13. Christ said, if they tell you he's in the desert, or if they tell you he's here or there, don't go. For the false Messiah will appear first before I return. So you see, it's very simple. Those Satan will return as the son of perdition and the great falling away comes because he will say, I have come to rapture you away. That's why the first woman taken in the field in Matthew 24 was not taken to heaven, but straight into Satan's bed of hell. Because men, women, listen to teachers who have been taught from commentaries to bring forth the same drivel, rather than listening to the simplicity in which God's word brings forth truth. Paul again saying, don't let my first letter confuse you. We're not, I repeat, we're not flying in some air body, spiritual body, until after the son of perdition. The word perdition, check it out for yourself, my friend. I've told you how. The word perdition means to perish. No one will perish until after Almighty God has judged them. There is only one son. Yes, Satan is God's son. He created him just as he created your body. That is clarified in Ezekiel chapter 28. In the day that I, cre thou, I created you, thou wast full of wisdom, so on and so forth. God loved him very much. And then he fell because of pride within himself. He's coming. What's he going to do after he gets here? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, in other words, he will pretend to be God, the Christ, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is why Jesus said, when you see that abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that being this Satan sitting in God's own seat, that's what he wanted in the heavens. He's going to take it here on earth, right on the Mount, of, of, um, uh, Mount Zion, right at the temple, claiming to be God and performing miracles as it is written in Revelation 13. At the snap of a finger, lightning coming from heaven, you think people looking for their so-called flyaway will not jump on board? You bet they will. Do I rejoice in that? No, I weep in that. That the simplicity, the warnings by Paul, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen concerning our getting back to Christ. I would, people would rather listen to some commentary peddler. Verse five, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. They talked about it in detail as they sit around the fires at night. Verse six, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. My friends, it is very important that you know how to reveal him in his time whereby you don't worship him because he's going to call himself God. Instead of uh, Antichrist means being properly translated instead of Jesus. 
He's going to be calling himself Jesus. He is a supernatural entity. He is the son of perdition. Now listen carefully. For the mystery of iniquity, that's lawlessness in the Greek, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This tells you exactly who we're discussing if you have kept up and outlined the subject and the object. Now, you will have some would-be teachers that would tell you, well, don't you understand what the word let means in English? It's an old Anglo-Saxon word. Hey, it doesn't matter what let means in any language except Greek. Because let is not the word involved. It's kateho, kateko. And kateko is not an old Anglo-Saxon, an old French, an old Latin, or any other word. It's a Greek word. It is a transitive verb, and no one, I mean no one, can deny that if they have any intelligence at all. Now, I'm sure you know what the word transitive means. It means that within itself it is a verb, but you must transfer to the subject to understand what is being said, and that's very complete, and it was done. It is known as a transitive verb to a scholar of God's Word. Now, what was the subject? The subject is Satan standing in the holy place, that's to say on Mount Zion, where the temple of God is supposed to be claiming to be God himself, that is to say, Savior. That's the subject. So the verb is that he will stand there you know the mystery of inequity, of lawlessness, do you? Well, do you know where Satan is? Well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 makes it very clear that he's in the heavens until Michael, who is the holding one, casts him out on earth for a little short season to sit on this temple of God claiming to be God. It's going to happen very soon. Therefore, the rapture theory sets you up to worship Satan. It is not true. It is not according to the Word of God. I want to say again, it does not matter what language or how you may use the word, only he who now let us will let until he be taken out of the way. Only Michael is going to put up with him and hold him until he is cast out on this earth and then de facto it comes to pass. Do you know why? I, I do not believe that God would allow the transitive verb to be here, to be used here in as much as there are some that are not supposed to know the truth because of the simplicity that is taught in God's word, everyone should quickly and readily recognize the truth. But there's a reason, verse eight, and then shall that wicked be revealed. The wicked, the Greek is the lawless one, that is Satan, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is, what is it that comes from the Lord's mouth? His tongue, which is to say his word. That is his sword. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, documentation. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, the Lord will not come until after the appearance of the son of perdition, standing in the holy place, claiming to be God, claiming he's ready to rapture everybody away. And with his miracles, he's going to deceive a lot. Where will you be? Verse 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan, meaning the false prophet also, that particular office, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Ooh, this world is not mentally prepared for that. 
They've been taught in their little houses on the corner and Bethel's, Bethabins are houses of repute. You're going to fly away. Just don't worry about anything. You don't have to understand the Word of God like the book of Revelation because you're going to be gone. You're going to be gone in the sack with Satan, friend, and you will be with child when the true Christ comes. No more a virgin, but spiritually seduced by Satan himself because you have listened to men rather than to dig for yourself the simplicity that is taught in the Word of God by God Himself. It is a dangerous thing to listen to man, this man or any other man, without checking it out for yourself. I'm, I'm going to go just another verse or two, verse 10. And with all deceivableness, all the trickery, everything he can sum of unrighteousness in them that perish, Again, do you know what that word perish means? Zippo, fini. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Do you know what the love of the truth is? The truth is God's Word. People won't study it. They want to listen to a bunch of commentary peddlers that do not study into the languages or the Word of God. It is real sad. But I would dare say that there's probably not two Christians, not over five at the most in the world today, that can handle the Masara itself. That's sad. But they would rather do something else, take the easy way, rather than studying the truth. And God said the punishment for it is they're going to believe that lie. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Who? The one sitting in Jerusalem to be worshipped. 12, That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. The truth again is the word of God but had pleasure in unrighteousness, a wedding out of season. To listen to the commentary peddlers rather than students of the Word of God which bring forth this, the splendid simplicity of truth in the Word of God whereby you could not be deceived. That you would receive that truth whereby you receive His love, understanding, clarity, so you see, the end time events such as rapture, see the word of rapture is not in the word of God. That's a, a coined phrase by man. Well, you read caught up, huh? Yeah, but you, surely you were wise enough. You're not as ignorant as the heathen are, are you, that you understand what caught up means? Hmm, I hope so. But they'll tell you it's there. I got news for you. Find it for me. It isn't. It, in fact, is the fertile seedbed for 666. Because those that believe upon the so called rapture doctrine are prime candidates to be deceived with their quick trip escape because they have been taught. Don't study the truth. You don't need it. You're going to be gone. One of the favorite things Satan loves from pulpits, no less, in so-called houses, Bethel's, Bethabins, or of ill repute, I know not. God knows. To teach people to go flying off after the fake husband instead of remaining virgins for the true Christ. Woe to those that are with child when I return and that give suck, Christ says in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13. He was not talking about a physical mother carrying a child in her womb, but about those that would spiritually be impregnated in their forehead, their mind, by the false teachings that Satan impregnates the ignorance 
to believe his wonderful lie and God allows it because man will not love his word and truth. Well, that's the way it is. That's the end times. Something to worry about? No, it's something to rejoice about. For as sure as the three, the Hebrew children, refused to bow a knee to the image made by the beast, that's to say the king of Babylon, who was a type of this one that's coming, the son of perdition. Sixty by six it was. Doesn't that warn you of something in the book of Daniel? And every time the six instruments played, again, the number of Satan, they refused to bow and cast into the fiery furnace. Heated seven times hotter than necessary. Those that cast them into the furnace were dead. But Nebuchadnezzar looked. He loved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he looked and he said, Did we not cast but three? There are four walking in the furnace. Jesus Christ himself walked the furnace, the Son of God, with them and brought them forth out of that furnace to say to you, it does not matter about Satan's tribulation. I will see you through if you have on the gospel armor to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. He didn't say to put the gospel armor on to, to sleep with Satan. but to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Ephesians chapter 6. What has Christianity turned into? That people would rather listen to commentary peddlers. Degrees in commentaries. All they can do is spew out what other men have said. And they cannot take the time to look into the simplicity of the language in which God spoke that gave us that truth. And whether it be in ignorance or what, I know not, I don't judge. And they are my brothers, but I think it's very sad that Christendom has come to this point. But then, not to worry, God himself said it would in the prophecies. It has happened. What an interesting year we have before us. Get ready, my friends. Mark the time. Nothing will ever be the same as we move into that era of the new world order and the new covenant made by our dear governor, of Arkansas. I love Arkansas. I hope you all <laughs> learn to be careful of the new covenant. You are warned. What an interesting year. Time to rejoice. Be happy. For when you accept his truth, you will not be deceived. All right, bless your hearts. We're gonna stop there a moment. Listen a moment, won't you please?